Um, we are really delighted to be here with you all, and I think we've got the best view here because we can see everyone's smiley faces just about with this light. Um, so it's our job to be hosting these morning sessions. So we've got three incredible speakers that we are going to be hearing from over the next three days. Um, and as you know, the theme of the camp is advancing in the supernatural. So what better book for us to look at together than the book of Acts, which goes through the movement of the early church and how the Holy Spirit was poured out and, um, yeah, poured out on God's people. Um, so we are going to hear from Steve in a little bit. Steve, would you, would you come up? Give him, a, give him a little round of applause. Um, each morning, we, we're going to have a little Q&A with the speaker so we can get to know them a little bit. And obviously, many of you will already know Steve. Um, but for Steve, Steve, for any who don't know you, where are you from? Uh, Cheltenham. You're from Cheltenham, so... Originally. Originally. And more recently from Oxford. And, um, and who are you here at Advance with? Everybody, and <laughs> Bev especially. And we have three daughters aged 16 and 13 and 9. Excellent. And um, just on camping, I know that there's a bit of a difference of opinion across the camp on whether we're sort of willing campers or less so. So on a scale of one to Bear Grylls, how happy a camper are you? Uh, we are pretty, ha pretty happy, actually. We have quite a lot of creature comforts which Bear Grylls would not approve of, <laughs> which makes us happier campers. Like than electricity. Than yeah, like electricity, yeah. yeah. Very yeah. sophisticated. <laughs> um, so a few other questions for you, Steve. Um, so that people can get to know you. It's a very important question. Are you a cat person or a dog person? Or, bonus option for you, a guinea pig person? Well, um, mm. There's a right answer here. <laughs> you've, exposed, you've exposed something you shouldn't have exposed. I, 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 when I was a scientist, I studied animal behaviour. I just see them, I'm sorry, I'm going to lose friends in saying this. None of them are small people in furry bodies. They... <laughs> so, so, Steve, tell us, what, what animals, what creatures did you spend most of your time with during, during those happy years? Uh, with those happy years of cockroach feeding behaviour studies. Yeah. So, Lovely. That's me. That's so anyone me. who wants to know more about the feeding behaviours of cockroaches, Steve and Bev and his family are staying just out, just out there. They've not brought any with them, to my knowledge. But uh, lots no, of lots no, of insight. No, but if, you, if you search the hedgerows, you may find some. So you know, as you like. So stay away from the hedgerows. Um, we've we've heard that one one of the speakers knows the right answer to this next question. So we're going to ask it every morning. <laughs> um, who's going to win the Premier League next season? Liverpool. Oh. Ah, maybe two of the speakers know the right answer. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> um, okay, and final question. What is your favourite parable, favourite story that Jesus told, or favourite thing that Jesus said? And uh, tell us a bit about why. Uh, when he, I love that bit in Luke 10 where the uh, disciples come back having seen demons flee and Jesus is filled with joy because of what's happened through them. I love that, Jesus filled with joy because of what he's sent us out to do, it happening, and he's like, yeah, that's great. So that would be that. Amazing. So we're just going to pray for Steve and then uh, let Steve open up the word of God to us. So let's just prepare our hearts. Father God, we thank you for Steve and for Bev and for the family, Lord, for the blessing that they are to us, Lord, for the wisdom that they have, for the way in which you've revealed yourself to us through them on so many occasions. Lord, would you anoint Steve now, Lord, as he opens up your scriptures to us. Lord, speak to us. Lord, help us to obey uh, what we hear. Lord, not just be hearers of the word. Uh, and Lord, would you pour out your spirit on us, we pray. Amen. 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 Brilliant. Uh, where's Greg? As I was preparing for this morning, I had a particular picture come to mind. So you'll understand how delighted I was when I got an email from Greg saying God had given him a very, very similar picture. So we thought we'd start there with what God is indeed saying to us today as well as looking at what he has given us in the scriptures. You're going to do magic with your laptop? Oh, yeah. Magic. It's not magic, it's science. Okay. <laughs> um, um, oh, uh, it's on my screen here, so 
Can you, there we go, great. I was um, praying about a week ago and, and this phrase came to me about the camp which is, here is love, vast as the ocean. Heard that before. Imagine being in this life raft and all you can see is water. All you can see is the ocean. But it's not a threatening thing. This is a safe thing. This is God's love. Here is love vast as the ocean. There's a place on the surface of the earth which is 1,670 miles from the nearest piece of land. So if you want to do that in kilometers, it's, seven, it's 270 kilometers. 1,670 miles. Here is love, vast as the ocean. You can see, as you try to travel, that would be days and days and days of traveling in God's love. So as we look at supernatural advance, whether it's that you need comfort or you've got concerns about worries and hurts and you want to heal the sick and see the lost saved and you want to take the nations for Christ, know this, know that God's love is focused on you and it's vast around you. Here is love vast as the oceans. Amen. Great, thank you. Could you take that mic with you? That's great, thank you. I've got enough other bits to manage. Great. So the purpose of the talks that we have these three mornings is to dig a little bit more into the scriptures. Uh, Jenny's already told us we're looking at the book of Acts, if you hadn't picked that up already this morning. And we're going to be looking at Acts chapters 1 and 2. And uh, in those couple of chapters, there are frightened people transformed and the city where they are those around them are a change. Now, uh, who has already heard a sermon before about the day of Pentecost? <laughs> ah, it's only about half of you. So that's interesting. Uh, as ever, there's more to be covered in these couple of chapters than will be covered in any single talk. Um, I believe that what I've got to draw out from the richness of these chapters this morning will be for a number of us, something of a balancing corrective. Uh, I believe that uh, for a number of us, what's going to happen in the next 45 minutes or so is that God is going to reframe this story and to see, for, to enable many of us to see a fresh focus in it. And I'm praying that out of that, as Mark spoke last night about one of the keys for us being a continuing hunger after God, that through looking at this text again this morning, God will increase our hunger for him. There is much more that he has intended for us in these few days. And the hunger that he puts into our hearts is what carries us towards him. It's a yearning that he has placed in us for more of him so that we will seek him, so that we will find him. It's not a yearning to be disappointed, but a yearning to be satisfied. Now, before getting to the text... There we are. That's what the text is all about. The difference a day makes and God's spirit on all people. But before we get to that, just want to uh, take a brief moment to be a little bit more theological, if I may. And to note that there are two, there are lots of questions asked about the book of Acts. But here are a couple. When we read the book of Acts, here's one question that might be asked. You may have asked this yourself. Is this story simply descriptive of what happened then? Or is it also prescriptive for us today? As we read it, are we meant simply to be inspired by what took place then? That's nice for them, and that's part of what has happened. How is this text normative for us? How does it, do, are we supposed to do just what it says today? That's one question. If it does tell us how we should be living today, then quite how does that work? Here's another question you may have heard over the years. Should, what should this bit, book be called? The book itself doesn't have a title in its original form. It was first called the Act of the Apostles, as far as we know, by Irenaeus in the second century. He might have been picking up on an existing tradition, but should it be called the Act of the Apostles, as, or those of us within the charismatic enjoy saying, should it be called the Acts of the Holy Spirit? 
because he's the one who is powerful and active in the story. So I'm going to come back to that second question later, but for now, I just want to take five minutes to think about the first one of these two questions. How does the book of Acts act in our lives? What's it supposed to be like for us? Now, there are two ways of reading the Bible that you may have been brought up on. If you're a bit older, then probably the way that you've been brought up to see the Bible is a bit like this. Uh, you may have been uh, brought up thinking of the, being taught that the Bible is the maker's manual, that since God knows us, uh, and it's his word, the instructions that we have here in the Bible are the best instructions for us. Um, there's also that brilliant acronym for the Bible, B-I-B-L-E, Basic Instructions Before Leaving Earth. You may have come across that. This way of looking at the scriptures says that what the Bible does is it, it tells us what to do. It's full of commands, it's full of instruction. There's another way of, read, of describing the whole Bible, which, if you're a little bit younger, may be more how you instinctively think and how lots of theologians today tend rather to describe the Bible, which is that it's all God's big story. And the wonderful thing about that is that it's our story, that the story that was unfolding in the time of Abraham and of Elijah and of Daniel and of the early church, that's our story. And we're also part of it. Reading the Bible as God's big story uh, doesn't so much tell us what to do, but it tells us things about God which are inspiring. Go, ah, that's what God's like. And then we have to work out what to do today in the light of that. Now, I have discovered that some people prefer one way of reading the Bible over another. Some people are most animated and committed to the Bible being the maker's manual. And indeed, there are plenty of commands in the scriptures that are God's word to us, which we must obey. There are other people who are much more excited about it as a story in which we now play a part. And of course, there are plenty of stories in the scriptures. Most of the Bible is made up of story. But here's the thing. These two things are meant to work together. It's not an accident. It's not like God's a little bit regretful that he put in quite so many commands to distract from the story. Or uh, a little bit disappointed in himself that he included quite so much story that people might get distracted by. It's all the word of God. So uh, let's look at this a slightly different way. In the scriptures, there are God's commands that tell us what we must do. And there's also the story of God's people, which tells us what we can do. Or to put that slightly differently, the stories give us insight into what it is that as God's people, we get to do. The commands tell us what we must do. The stories tell us what it is that we can do, what we may do, what we get to do. And these two things, they are two sides of the same coin. We don't have to choose between them because God in his wisdom has put both kinds of things in his word and they work together. So we are commanded in scripture to love each other. And then we have stories like the book of Ruth, which shows us what love can be like. Committed love that she had for her, her mother-in-law and the love that she gained for the people of God. Uh, we have commands in scripture to witness, to evangelize and proclaim God's word. And then we have a story like Jonah, which shows us what that can be like. And now it's really good for us to obey God's commands to go and be witnesses because he has ways and means. We are commanded in scripture to trust God for provision. And then we have the story of Abraham and Isaac. And it says in Hebrews that Abraham knew that he wasn't going to end up sacrificing his own son because he knew that God would make provision for the sacrifice that was to be offered. And this story tells us what it's like, the life that we can get to live as people who obey God's command to trust him. We're commanded to, to receive the Holy Spirit, to, re 
to receive him, to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. And here in this morning's text, in Acts 1 and 2, what we get to see is what it, the life that we get to live, what it, it can be like. It's a command, but this story tells us what it's like that we can indeed be filled with the Holy Spirit. So my hope is that in reading these couple of chapters this morning, this whole reading, this whole passage will sound to each one of us as it's meant to be as an invitation. This is what we, we can live. This is what God has for us. So what we're going to do is turn to the text. I'm not going to read the entirety of the two chapters. I'm going to jump th- uh, past most of Peter's speech. But we are going to take time to read the text this morning. I'm going to be reading from the NIV, if you wish to follow along. It's not going to appear on the screens. Um, We're going to listen to the Word of God. This is what's written by Luke. In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote to you about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up into heaven, after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he'd chosen. After his suffering, he showed himself to these men and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Don't leave Jerusalem, but wait. Wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So when they met together, they asked him, Lord, are you at this time, are you going to restore the kingdom of Israel? And he said to them, It's not for you to know the time or dates the Father has set by his own authority, but, like like I said, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And after he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. And they were looking intently up into the sky as it was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you've seen him going into heaven. And then they returned to Jerusalem from the hill called the Mount of Olives, a Sabbath day's walk from the city. When they arrived, They went upstairs to the room where they were staying, and those present were Peter, John, James, and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James, son of Alphaeus, and Simon the Zealot, and Judas, son of James. And they all joined together constantly in prayer, along with the women, and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. In those days, Peter stood up amongst the believers, a group numbering about 120, and said, Brothers, The scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit spoke long ago through the mouth of David concerning Judas, who served as guide for those who arrested Jesus. He was one of our number, and he shared in this ministry, and in brackets here, with the reward he got for his wickedness, Judas bought a field. There he fell headlong. His body burst open, and all his intestines spilled out. Everyone in Jerusalem heard about this, and so they called that field in their language, Akeldama, that is, field of blood. For, said Peter, it's written in the book of Psalms, may his place be deserted, let there be no one to dwell in it, and may another take up his place of leadership. Therefore, it's necessary, listen carefully to this, it's necessary to choose one of the men who have been with us the whole time, the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from John's baptism to the time when Jesus was taken up from us. For one of these must become a witness with us of his resurrection. So they proposed two men, Joseph called Barsabbas, also known as Justice, and Matthias, and then they prayed, Lord, you know everyone's heart. Show us which of these two you've chosen to take over this apostolic ministry which Judas left to go where he belongs. 
And then they cast lots, and the lot fell to Matthias, and so he was added to the 11 apostles. When the day of Pentecost came, which is about 10 days after Jesus went up into heaven, it's 50 days after the Passover, and he'd been around for 40 days, so about, about another 10 days later, there or thereabouts, they were all together in one place. Suddenly, a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and it filled the whole house where they were sitting and they saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and they began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. And now they were staying in Jerusalem God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. And when they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one of them heard them speaking in his own language, utterly amazed. They asked, aren't all these men who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in his own native tongue? Parthians and Medes and Elamites and residents of Mesopotamia, that's quite a long way away, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, Jews and converts, Cretans and Arabs. And we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, what does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said, ha, they've had too much wine. Then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed the crowd, fellow Jews, and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These men, they're not drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. And he goes on to explain this has been God's plan for a long time. And then the people, having heard it, verse 37, they were cut to the heart. And they said to Peter and the other apostles, brothers... What shall we do? Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This promise is for you and your children, for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. And with many other words, he warned them and he pleaded with them, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. And those who accepted his message were baptized and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship and to the breaking of bread and to prayer. And everyone was filled with awe and many wonders and miraculous signs were done by the apostles. And all the believers were together and had everything in common, selling their possessions and goods. They gave to anyone as he had need, and every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Here's a few points to draw out from all the richness of that reading. Here's the first thing I want to say. Uh, we can surrender our agenda. The disciples were pretty clear about what they thought should happen, that it was time now. I mean, Jesus was talking about his death for a while, and they didn't quite get it, then he died, and they didn't get it, and then he rose again, and then they were very pleased and excited that now, at last, but then he'd spent 40 days with them and with hundreds of others, but not yet overthrowing the powers that be, and so they say, Lord, so when are you getting with the plan? And Jesus says, that's not for you to know, just wait. Now, I think British people are deluded about how patient we are because of our habit of queuing. We think, generally, that because we queue nicely, we are more patient than those other people that just form a mob and head towards the front. But I don't think that's true, because 
I think what a cue does for us is it's a way of managing our deep impatience. <laughs> and you can tell that by what happens when someone tries to jump the cue. It's like, no, that's not acceptable. You, you cannot do that. We are not very patient people. Uh, compare that to our friends who live in the Western Sahara, where uh, Ben and Michelle Price, some of you will know, who when they need to go up to the capital city to get some papers, expect to go and wait in a queue in temperatures warmer than we had yesterday for up to eight hours. So much so that they take a picnic with them. So much so that they don't only take a picnic for themselves, but they take bags of oranges to share with others who are waiting in the queue because they see being in the queue as an evangelistic opportunity to share God's love and then his word with people. That's patience. We're not very good at waiting, are we? So here's something that we're commanded to do. Be still before the Lord, all mankind. Is the word of the Lord to us from Zechariah chapter 2. The scriptures say, those who wait on the Lord will have their strength renewed. Here's a command to us to wait. I wonder how long it's worth waiting. How, how long would you think it's worth waiting to meet with God. We've got about three days here and we're really hoping that God will meet with us before Sunday evening. Best we can tell from the story of Acts chapters one and two, it was about 10 days between when Jesus said, just wait. And when the Holy Spirit came. And I do believe God wants to settle something in our hearts about the priority of his, his presence and waiting for him to come. Uh, in our meetings, we are so blessed by God's goodness and his coming swiftly to us so often that we can fall somehow into thinking that what happens is, you know, when we get to the third song, that's when the prophetic words start coming. <laughs> or, you know, after the preach and when we've broken bread together, that's when, that's when I encounter God. Whatever it is that has been the most common way of God making himself present in your experience of life, you start to think, well, that, that, that's how it works. What waiting does is remind us that God is not responsive to some kind of technique. That if only we had the right style, if only we had the right process, then he'd come. He's sovereign Lord, and he'll come when he pleases. And so he says, wait. Before we finish this morning's session, there's going to be not 10 days, but uh, that would be quite clever, wouldn't it, to achieve that before lunchtime. But we're going to have a little bit of time to make a start in waiting on God. And I'm delighted that Andy Bruce has taken the initiative to have more time in here this afternoon to wait longer. But there's going to be quite a bit of waiting in this camp. And I don't know how much of a hurry you're in to meet with God, but the first thing is we can surrender our agenda, sit, even lie, and wait. But here's the thing that I felt most strongly to bring out of this passage this morning, and it's simply this. These, this, this story tells us that we can know that God is with us. It's in this little phrase, you will be my witnesses. When we read in chapter 1 and verse 8, you'll receive the Holy Spirit, there will be power and you will be my witnesses. We tend to think in terms of, well, I'm a little bit nervous about being an evangelist. The Holy Spirit will come and help me to be more confident. But there's more to it than that. That's why I slowed down a little bit around verses 21 and 22 and reading about the, the new 12th man that was appointed. Because if you hear, if you note what was said, let me open it again. It says in verse 22, one of these must become a witness with us of his resurrection. So they're looking for a witness. In this passage that's all about becoming witnesses, there's an instance of finding a witness. It says in verse 21, it's necessary to choose one of the men who've been with us the whole time the Lord Jesus went in and out amongst us. That is, 
A witness is not simply someone that speaks for Jesus, but someone who's been with Jesus and then talks about it. Someone who just taught, someone who's just heard a message about Jesus and passes that message on isn't technically a witness, they're simply a publicist. A witness is someone who's been with him, who has seen him, who knows him from personal experience and can talk about that. We're called to be witnesses. The Holy Spirit comes upon us and makes us into witnesses. And this shows us that the Holy Spirit doesn't come simply to empower us, but to do something more, to do something deeper, to make God's presence known with us, that we might have a relationship with him, God with us. And I wonder how often when we've sought a fresh baptism of the Holy Spirit, our focus has been on, Lord, I need a bit more power. Life's not quite working. The people that I know I'd love to see healed. I'd love to see revelation. I'd love to be a more confident evangelist. God, would you give me these things? And all the time God's saying, well, yes. And I'd prefer to start just by being with you. Can we spend some time together? And that's the first thing that this uh, passage tells us from the fact of the witnesses, but also from this picture here. It's a picture of what's in the, in the passage. These tongues of fire symbolize God's presence. We can think of Moses at the burning bush. Meets with God where there's the fire symbolizing God's presence or the dedication of the temple by Solomon, where it says in 2 Chronicles chapter 7, when Solomon finished praying, fire came down from heaven, consumed the burnt offering and sacrifices, and the glory of the Lord filled the temple. I can think of what God said to Joshua when he rather nervously took on the leadership of the people of Israel. He says in Joshua chapter 1, you will see victory everywhere you go. That is, you will experience my power, you will see my power, but it's because I will be with you as I was with my servant Moses. And so the second question that sometimes gets asked about this book, what should we call it really? Whose acts are they? Is It's not actually a choice between whether it's the acts of the apostles or whether it's the acts of the Holy Spirit. The glorious truth is it's the acts of of the Holy Spirit with all of God's people. We get to live this life with the Holy Spirit, with God in our midst. We need to slow down here a little bit and understand how profound this is. I have a picture here that for all of us describes what life was like at the start for every one of us. We can't remember it well, but the most basic fundamental experience of life that we have had is gazing into a mother's face. You don't remember it happening. But studies show that if children are deprived of this most basic experience of a face reliably present, smiling upon them, then all kinds of chaos happens in their psychological development. It is a necessary necessary thing. This is the way that God's made us, that we don't even develop properly as people without a face smiling upon us. That's why babies cry when their mother's face is taken away, because it's not just that the prospect of being fed is being taken away, but, but actually their world is being taken away. The most important thing has been taken away. Every one of us is made, born in the image of God. God who is Trinity, God, who is Trinity, has a profound intolerance for loneliness and isolation. It makes no sense to him. A child deprived of a smiling face is not merely unhappy. There's something much more profound. Something about the image of God in each one of us is broken when we haven't got faces around us. When no one is gazing upon us, and we are isolated and alone, something about what it means to be in the image of God is taken away from us. Here's a picture that I like. This is a drawing of what it might have been like when God first breathed into Adam. 
which means that when Adam awoke as a living being, the very first thing that Adam saw, his waking vision, the first experience of humanity was to look into the face of God Almighty, the Father who had created him. There's nothing more basic, nothing more important to us. That's why in number six, we come to the priestly blessing and it says, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you. What a curse not to have the Lord's face shining upon us. What a blessing to have his face shining upon us. And it is our privilege as Christians to experience this day by day by day. In 2 Corinthians 3 and verse 16, it says, whenever anyone turns to the Lord, the veil, something that separated us from him, is taken away, and now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. We all, with unveiled faces, contemplate the Lord's glory and are being transformed into his image with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. So here's an invitation. First bit of the invitation is, let's, let's take some time to wait. Let's surrender our agendas and see what God's got for us. Let's lay aside any sense that we've got the techniques, that we know which handle to crank to make the Holy Spirit come. Let's First invitation is, let's be ready to wait. But here's the second invitation. The second thing that we get to do is that we get to receive the Holy Spirit. God himself will come close, approach us, touch us, and dwell with us. We can know that God is with us, nourishing us dispelling our loneliness, revealing to us who we truly are and making us like him. Several years ago, um, a good friend shared with me a picture that helpfully called me on in my spiritual life. And it went like this. He said, you know, when we think about waves, one of the things that we like to do when we go to the seaside is to splash around in the waves and to have fun. And that's how some people might be thinking about the life of the Holy Spirit. It's fun and it's good. But there's, there is a yearning in our hearts for what Mark Mumford was talking about last night, which is to be riding a wave. That I've never, I, I don't, who surfs here? A few, a few, I know a few of you do. Um, I don't, but it looks fun. And we, we, long for that. Now, this is what this friend said. So the thing is, what you need to learn to do, Steve, is, is this other thing, which is to go, because the way you catch a wave is not to sit in the place where all the waves are crashing. The way that you catch a wave is you duck under them and you go further out to sea to the place where you can see waves forming, and there you, you wait and you wait for a wave that you have a ride to come. And Steve, you need to learn to not just be excited about activity, but go out to a quieter place and become more sensitive to what the Holy Spirit is planning to do. That was really helpful for me. It might be helpful for some of you. There's something else though, and this is what Greg has shared with us already. There's something more than simply getting out far enough to be able to spot the waves that are coming. There's something that God calls us to, which is just to go out into the open ocean. Um, I tried to find a picture of someone on a coracle, and that's what I found. Think of the Irish missionaries who so entrusted themselves to God that he would take them where he wanted them to go. They'd get in a little coracle and push out to sea and trust that whichever waves came, whatever wind came, that wherever they landed, that's where God wanted them to be. There is in that picture an abandonment to God, a surrendering of our agenda, that we're not only interested in his presence, because if we spend time in his presence, we get to spot the next wave early. We don't only go into his presence because then he gives us something that is exciting. We don't only go into his presence for what we can get. We go into his presence because his love is vast as an ocean. 
and there's no better place to be. There are plenty of waves. That, <laughs> the, the biggest waves of all are out in the open ocean. And most of them are not seen by human eyes. There is more, there's more for us to discover by taking time to simply be in God's presence. There are things that he wants us to know that will not be discovered sat in that little strip of the ocean just beyond where the waves are crashing, hoping for the next thing to come along. There's more. That's why we need to wait. And there's more that he has for us. Of course, uh, reading from Acts 1 and 2, having highlighted the fact that God with us is the greatest treasure and the strongest invitation, it is, of course, true that these people were changed. They were frightened they became bold. They were only about 120 in number. They quickly became 3,000. They were hidden in a corner. Then they were proclaiming things from the streets. Uh, they were confused. And then they could explain things. They were mono-ethnic, all Galileans. And by the end of chapter 2, there's something multi-ethnic happening, which is a delight to God's heart. It's changed people who changed the world. And if we go through these, that chapter 2, very quickly, we can see some of the changes that come by the power of the Holy Spirit with us. We can speak in tongues. If you've come to this camp and you've not experienced the blessing of speaking in tongues, please get people to pray for you, because it's a, it's a strong expectation, a regular pattern. Talking about how story works, the regular drumbeat of baptism in the Holy Spirit in the book of Acts sees and they spoke in tongues, and they spoke in tongues, and they spoke in tongues. The one occasion where it's not named, the people could still see that something happened, and uh, it's most likely that they spoke in tongues then as well, because it's what happened all the time. Do we have to speak in tongues? You know, I think that's the wrong question. The point is that you get to. And on this point, there's further to go out in speaking in tongues. I don't know how many languages you have. I, I don't know whether in your speaking in tongues you've yet discovered the kind of prayer language that comes when you've been interceding in tongues for an hour or more, for example. I don't, I don't know. There, there are, there's further to go for many of us than we've yet got. We've perhaps taken the gift of tongues and got it in our back pockets and it's a you know when we start a prayer meeting it's our little warm-up to get us you know stir the spirit i'm now edified great we can carry on but there's more i remember challenging our leadership team in oxford to pray in tongues for an hour a day and see what happened only one of them did it and it wasn't me <laughs> it's a great idea but one woman called helen did and she said the difference in life she said she cycled around the city and she said and some of you will know exactly what this is like when you're trying to cycle and the tires aren't pumped up and it just takes more effort but if the tires are pumped up properly you feel like you're just sailing along and she said that was her picture of the difference that it made to to receive more of that gift to spend more time in god's presence discovering the power of that particular gift and i just want to say Let's not think that we, you know, we've ticked that box, done that. There is more. There is an ocean. And few of us are beyond the shallows. Secondly, we see the bit that I largely ran past and just took the bookends from of Peter, who had denied Christ, lacked courage to speak, now being the one who speaks boldly. We need that. When uh, many of our churches have been involved in the turning, which is launching very excitingly in London uh, in a big way in September. If you don't know what the turning is, it's a pattern of cold contact street evangelism, which makes most people think, goodness me, no. No, no, I'm not going to do that. But what we discovered was that in the wisdom of the pattern that God had given, spending an evening worshipping God, soaking in his presence, enjoying that he is with us. What we found was that in those moments of being in his presence, a boldness just, just kind of appeared in us. 
and people who would never have approached someone uh, out of you know cold contact on the streets were going up to people and saying, "Hi, God's got a great plan for your life. He loves you. Can we talk to you about that?" And seeing wonderful things happen in people's lives. It's an outcome of God's presence with us. What else do we find? We find that we can perform signs and wonders. Now, you may have come to a camp entitled Supernatural Advance, thinking this is the, this is the thing. We've come, for, we've come to learn how to do signs and wonders, because the title of the camp rather implies that. It fits in, but it fits in to the bigger picture, and the bigger picture is God with us. Signs and wonders happen in God's presence. They happen around people that have the Holy Spirit living in them. It's not so much that there are things to learn about how to pray for healing, because there are ways of, of missing it. But it is not the case that once you've been to a seminar on healing, you've learned the technique, having learned the technique that when you're with someone, you can crank that handle and out pops a healing. We know that's not how it works. It's much more relational than that. It's about God being with us and us carrying him into the places where we go. And of course, the end of the chapter reminds us that we can form community, which is no small miracle. I don't know how you feel about church politics sometimes. Um, the little bit I've got to know about mosque politics tells me that we are greatly helped by the gospel of Jesus Christ. We can form community together. Oh, I don't want to get stuck on that. These changes, these changes all come from the Holy Spirit being with us. So often, we're only interested in the next wave for our lives, for our church, for our nation, rather than truly valuing the ocean, which is the vastness of God's love. God being with us is better than him doing things for us. Imagine I invite you around for a meal, and you come, and I say, go, go and sit at the table there, and then I disappear into the kitchen, and I cook you the most amazing meal. It takes all my time, all my energy. I'm a bit flustered. I place the meal in front of you. I say, enjoy that. I've got pudding to make. I go back to the kitchen. I make the pudding. I'm pretty exhausted by then. I put that in front of you. You're getting a bit bored of my lack of company. You eat the pudding quickly, and we say, ta that's me doing something for you. It's not what you're expecting when you're invited around for a meal. What you're hoping for is time with someone. And that's what God's offering us. He's not just offering us to do something for us. He's offering to be with us. The story of Pentecost tells us that God doesn't just turn up to do things for his people, like the fire that fell in answer to Elijah's prayers on Mount Carmel. But he is with us. He invites us to receive him, to live in us, walking, living life together, him supplying all of our needs along the way. I want to tell you a few stories, one way or another, from times past. Let's start here. This is a copy of a newspaper that was produced in 1906, just after the uh, Holy Spirit broke out in Azusa Street, which many of you will know is the beginning of modern Pentecostalism as we know it. Uh, this was produced as the, this is the first copy ever of the apostolic faith. It's full of stories. Here's a few of the stories that come out from it. A little girl who walked with crutches and had tuberculosis of the bones, as the doctors declared, was healed and dropped her crutches and began to skip about the yard. That sounds good. This is good as well. Many have laid aside their glasses and had their eyesight perfectly restored. The deaf have had their hearing restored. That sounds good too. A man was healed of asthma of 20 years standing. Many have been healed of heart trouble and lung trouble. This is great stuff to read in the newspaper, isn't it? Um, under the headline, Tongues Convict Sinners, it says this, we, uh, okay, a remarkable incident of God's searching power was received in Melrose, Kansas, during a revival which had been held by some of our young people in that place. 
The power of the Holy Spirit was greatly manifested in the meetings by the speaking in unknown tongues. This was much criticized in the town and vicinity. So the principal physician, who was familiar with several different languages, was prevailed upon to go to the meetings in order to denounce the whole as a fake. Miss Tuthill, in an unknown language to herself, but known to him as Italian, spoke his full name, which no one in the town knew save himself, telling him things that happened in his life 20 years ago and on up to the present time until he cried for mercy. <laughs> He found full salvation the next day and is now a believer in the gospel that Jesus taught and also in the power of the Holy Ghost given unto us to witness to a living Christ. He now says he would rather pray for the sick than give drugs and is seriously thinking of leaving the profession. Well, I don't know if that was where he ended up, but you can see why he might be tempted to make that move. There's a story in here about some Russians hearing God in Ru I can't find it now. Uh, you can look this up online. If you Google the apostolic faith, there's a whole list of things. I also wanted to draw your attention to this in the midst of it all, because we can be appropriately excited and our faith stirred by tongues and healing, which particularly accompanied that outpouring of the Holy Spirit. But in the midst of it, this. A brother who received the baptism with the Holy Ghost in his own home, in family worship, in trying to tell about it, said... It was a baptism of love, such abounding love, such compassion seemed almost to kill me by its sweetness. People don't know what they're doing when they stand out against it. The devil never gave me such a sweet thing. This baptism fills us with divine love. The Holy Spirit poured out at Pentecost. Uh, here's a book, you may or may not have come across, some writings from an earlier outpouring of God, which we call the Great Awakening, which began in America, um, that's what this tells about, in the 1730s, and then which the Wesleys and others got caught up with in the 1740s. Right at the beginning of this, God moved in a town called Northampton, the settlers not being very original in renaming places when they got there, and in the 1730s there was a young girl, young woman, called Abigail Hutchinson, who was something of an invalid, physically weak. And as she saw God beginning to move on others in the town, began to seek out for God for herself. And then something happened. Talk about the difference a day makes. On a Monday morning, this happened. She awakened on Monday morning, a little before day, and she wondered within herself at the easiness and the calmness she felt in her mind, which was of a kind she'd never felt before. As she thought of this, such words as these were in her mind, that the words of the Lord are pure words, health to the soul and marrow to the bones. And then these words, the blood of Christ cleanses from all sin, which were accompanied with a lively sense of the excellence of Christ of his sufficiency. And then she thought of that expression, it is a pleasant thing for the eyes to behold the sun, which were words that seemed to her then very applicable to Jesus Christ. And by these things, her mind was led into such contemplations and views of Christ as filled her full exceeding of joy. She told her brother in the morning that she had seen Christ the last night and that she had really thought that she had not had enough knowledge to be converted, but she said God can make it quite easy. On Monday, she felt all day a constant sweetness in her soul. She had a repetition of the same experience three mornings together, each day brighter than the one before. At the last time on Wednesday morning, while in the enjoyment of a spiritual view of Christ's glory, her soul was filled with distress for Christless persons to consider what a miserable condition they were in. And she felt a strong inclination immediately to go forth and warn sinners and propose to her brother to assist her in going from house to house. 
She had many extraordinary discoveries of the glory of God and Christ. Soon after this, she went to a private religious meeting, what we might call a house group. And her mind was full of a sense and view of the glory of God all the time. She, when she was asked concerning what she'd experienced, she began to give an account that as she was relating it, had such a strong sense of the same things that her strength failed and they were obliged to take her and lay her on a bed. I wonder when that last happened in, any, in your house group. Someone saw so much of Christ that they had to be taken home to bed. Uh, she also went on to say here, she thought that she had experienced so much of the love of God that like the people at Azusa Street, that it would kill her. She'd experienced so much. Jonathan Edwards, writing about her, says, she had sometimes the powerful breathings of the Spirit of God upon her soul. She often expressed an exceeding compassion towards persons in a Christless condition. And she would sometimes appear with a pleasant smile on her face. And once when her sister took notice of it and asked why she smiled, she replied, I am brimful of a sweetness within. These are stories that we do well to attend to because there's something more that God wants for us. I just want to finish with one, two more things. I have a friend who's an Indian evangelist. Um, some of you from Oxford will have heard this story before, but he was preaching to a, a group of tens of thousands of people outdoors at what they would call a crusade when the RSS turned up, who are the militant wing of the Hindu Nationalist Party in India. And they turned up and they said, so you're here in Jesus' name, proclaiming salvation and proclaiming healing. So what we've done is we've brought with us this young man who, as they described him, was spastic, I, something like cerebral palsy. And they said, so what's going to happen is you're going to pray for him. And then one of two things is going to happen. Uh, if he's healed, we're going to pay for your crusade. If he's not healed, we're going to beat you up. So uh, he did what you'd expect. He, he prayed for him. And glory be, this guy was changed as he prayed for him. But that's not the story. The story is, as this friend Joshua tells it, is the nub of it is this, that afterwards he wasn't pleased at the miracle that had taken place. Because afterwards, he reflected on the state of his own heart, which was that all the time he was praying for this needy young man, all he was thinking about himself was, Lord, please make this work. I don't want to be beaten up. Please make this work. I don't want to be beaten up. And so in the moment of praying for someone else, in the power of the Holy Spirit, he wasn't thinking about them at all. And afterwards, something in the his walk with the Holy Spirit, he sensed the grieving of the Holy Spirit that in, even in that moment, there was something better than just seeing the power of God. It's meant to be the power of God that comes in the context of the oceans of God's love, which include us and all of his children. God wants to retrieve something or perhaps put it in place for the first time, which is that in our charismatic life, it finds its right place in the context of God's presence with us, his ocean of love for us and for all people in which we can sit and we can wait. Spurgeon, reflecting on the glory of God being with us, put it like this, using the name Emmanuel, meaning God with us. Emmanuel, he preached. This is wisdom's mystery, God with us. Sages see it and wonder. Angels ache at the beauty of it. The plumb line of reason cannot reach halfway into its depths. Emmanuel, God with us. It is the Christian's strength. How could you preach the gospel if that one word were taken away? Emmanuel. How could you bend your knees in prayer? How could the missionary go to foreign lands? How could the martyr stand at the stake if that one word were taken away, Emmanuel. 
God with us. It is the sufferer's comfort. It is the balm of his woe. It is the alleviation of his, mir- is of his misery. It is the sleep which God gives to his beloved. It is their rest after exertion and toil. Emmanuel, God with us. There is no higher height. It is eternity's anthem. It is heaven's hymn. It is the shout of the saints. It is the song of the redeemed and the anthem of the angels. Emmanuel, God with us. God with us. We're going to wait upon him. Um, So we're going to take some time to just be in the Lord's presence. Um, Soaking prayer may be something that you're very familiar with or something that's quite new to you. For those who uh, are perhaps unfamiliar with it, I'd encourage you to just reflect on one of those those pictures that we saw of the mother with her child or of... Uh, or of God Almighty breathing life into man. Um, if it's something that you're more familiar with, then perhaps you've got uh, some simple prayers, Lord Jesus, have mercy on me, or come Holy Spirit, that you are just going to pray. But we're going to create some space here. Feel free to move out of your seats, lie down, stand, go outside. Uh, so we're going to have some quiet time. And then after a few moments, um, Phil and a few of the band are going to come and lead us in some uh, worship without words, just to continue that atmosphere of the presence of God. And I, I, won't, I wouldn't be able to preempt all that God might do in this time. Um, we see in, in Acts 2, uh, after the Holy Spirit comes, just there's that little bit where it talks about prayer, it talks about community, it talks about fellowship, it talks about devotion to the apostles' teaching, it talks about going to those who are far off. There's any number of things that God might do, of gifts that he might pour out, and we're just going to wait. Um, so if I could invite Phil and the, the band up, we're just going to take a few minutes of, of, of quiet, um, and then don't be put off when uh, Phil and the band start to play quietly. Um, But this is just space to wait.